This is my ultimate hunting rifle. Gavin Gear here from ultimatereloader.com. I'm talking about this ultra lightweight, full custom 6.5 PRC hunting rifle that I just finished the core build on. What I wanted to do in this video is catch you all up on the journey that's taken me to this point. Right now, this rifle has been dry fit. It's ready for a bedding job. Then it's gonna be scope install and then off to the range. So let me start by reviewing all of the parts and pieces that have gone into this build. So the build is built on a Pierce Engineering Remington 700 semi-clone titanium action. It's bare titanium action with a pinned titanium recoil lug. It's got a chromoly bolt, external bolt release, and a 20 MOA pinned on scope rail. Moving over to the barrel, we've got a benchmark stainless one and eight twist, 24 inch finished length, five groove barrel blank with Hell's Canyon custom carbon wrap job on it. This was a really interesting barrel to work with. I haven't chambered a carbon barrel. Looking forward to telling you about that process. We've got a benchmark custom carbon stock. We've got Red Snake Tactical bottom metal. This has got the bolt release right here. Accurate mag, 10 round detachable box magazine. I like to have magazines loaded and ready to go and to have the rifle in a known safe condition, pop it in, chamber around, ready to roll if you come up on something unexpectedly. So, so far, this rifle is just what I had envisioned. And what I wanted to do was take the skills that I learned at Gordy Gritter's precision rifle building classes just a couple of weeks ago that I was at that and apply that to this rifle build. That and also to confer with the folks at Benchmark Barrels with regard to how to work specifically with this barrel. So what I started to do with the plan was basically to, to take the action and to, to do a basic evaluation on it. And one of the things that I noted was I didn't have full contact on both of the locking lugs. So what I did was I took some 400 grit lapping compound and I did a quick lapping job and it didn't take much to bring both of those locking lugs into full contact with the seats. That is one of the most critical aspects of making sure that your action geometry is intact. And I did that with the trigger installed, as Gordy suggests, because that's going to change the orientation of the bolt. With it cocked, pressing up on the back of the bolt, that's the way that you want to do it. So with just a little bit of lapping of those lugs, the action was ready to go. Then it was time to take a look at the prints that are provided by Pierce Engineering. There's one for a traditional counterbore bolt nose, and then there's also one for a cone breech. And I had the traditional counterbore type bolt protrusion. And so I did a real detailed examination of this print the biggest difference between this custom action and a standard Remington 700 action is that the tenon threads are 18 threads per inch instead of 16 threads per inch. That is actually pretty standard for a lot of the Remington 700 custom actions that are semi-clones. That's why it's called a semi-clone. It's the same basic pattern, but there's different tenon threading on this, and there's also the external bolt release, to name just a, a couple things. So... I reviewed that and then I went through and I created a version of Gordy Gritter's build sheet that he provides for the class with a little bit more detail on it and did all of my calculations. And what I came up with is I could have used this print as is provided by Pierce Engineering, but I made a couple very minor modifications just to make sure that all of my dimensions were gonna come into the tolerances that I specified. So it's really helpful to have that kind of information available from the manufacturer. Another thing that I did to prepare the lathe for this build was I did a very close examination of the alignment between the tailstock and the headstock. Because I've been using a JGS Precision floating reamer holder, this time I thought I would try the Gratan Rifles fixed reamer holder. This is a Morse Taper 3 dead center, and there's some custom tooling here 
in the middle, I added this depth stop bar here for my in magnetic indicator, which is on top of the tailstock in the lathe. And what these screws allow you to do is to steer the front of the reamer where the bushing is or the pilot and to guide that in into the bore. So the assumption here is that your lathe is perfectly centered with the between the tailstock and the headstock. And if that is the case, you can guide the back of the reamer in with a center instead of having something that floats. And so that worked well. I did get just a touch of slippage. I'll talk about that. I modified the set screw and polished it a little bit too much. So the next time I try this one, I'm going to use a standard set screw with a dimple face on it. And I think that will uh, make this a, a perfect center. So what I found with the Precision Matthews lathe is I actually did a modification to the tailstock so that I can use a torque wrench, again, like Gordy Gritters recommends, so that you're torquing the clamp for the tailstock down to the same force each time. And when I had it at about 30 foot-pounds of torque to torque it down, my center in the tailstock was within one ten thousandth of an inch on height. Now that's a critical thing about this Precision Matthews PM1440 GT lathe because in talking with other folks in the industry, a lot of brand new lathes are shipped with the tailstock about three to five thousandths high, three or four typically. And what that does is it allows you to compensate for wear over the years as the tailstock wears away or the, the ways wear away a little bit and it'll bring that down to zero. Well, if you're maintaining your machine and if you're doing precision work from the get-go and you're going to use a fixed method like this, that's not what you want. So, just a little preview into some of the work that went into the build. Let me cover that build, all the barrel work, in detail next. With the lathe alignment checked and everything else set out and ready to go, it was time to start the build. And I have multiple Remington 700 builds on the channel, so I'm not going to cover everything in detail. I'll point you to those stories. But what I do want to talk about is the specific things that I did with this carbon wrap barrel blank and some things that I applied from taking Gordy's Master Precision Rifle Builders class. So I started with the alignment process. I did the same basic build steps on the breech end as I did with the 300 PRC build. So you'll want to check out that video for all of the specifics and the details. Uh, but to dial things in, I, I started with a facing off of the breech end. I did my pre-drill within about 30 thousandths of an inch of where the shoulder area of the chamber would be. And I used this Mitutoyo 10th indicator with a 2x tip on it. So it's twice as long. That means that every tick mark on the dial reads two ten thousandths of an inch. And the basic game is to get the area of the bore, the grooves specifically, just ahead of where the pre-drill is, and then about an inch or so forward of that, running perfectly true at both points. You're working the chuck jaws and you're working the outboard spider to get that short section of bore perfectly aligned. Now what I did notice at this point is there was a slight bow in the barrel from when the carbon wrapping was done. And so I had to just make carefully sure later in the build to clock the barrel correctly so that it's pointing either up or down. And for a long range gun, you want that pointing up. That's just one detail. I'm going to have to see how this shoots. It should be just fine, um, but we'll know only when uh, we put rounds through the rifle. And so after getting that section of the bore in perfect alignment, I went and I did all of the rest of the steps. Turning the tenon down, threading the tenon, getting the tenon cut to length, but a little bit long. That's uh, one of those last steps that you do uh, later in the build. Now, this chambering process was not perfect. When I started, I didn't do an adequate job of checking the fit of my reamer bushing. And I've got a five groove barrel and a six flute reamer. And as Gordy mentions in his book and in his class, it's kind of everywhere he gets the opportunity to, that is potentially a recipe for disaster because there's a certain type of resonance that gets set up while you're reaming if you have a six flute reamer and you don't have a six or four groove barrel. There's something about five grooves 
and six reamer flutes, that can be incredibly problematic. And I noticed that straight away from when I started cutting the chamber. I monitored it very closely and I used the patch trick, which uh, Dave Manson, I'm using his reamer, uh, mentions, Gordy mentions. And that didn't really improve things to the level that I was happy with. So I took another look at the reamer bushings and I discovered that you know, once I'd gotten into the bore, you know, basically that breech end is, is cut and you're into the consistent portion of that bore, I was undersized by at least a thousandth of an inch. So I moved up a couple sizes in reamer bushings for a nice sliding fit and things improved from then. I did still have to use a couple different, you know, patch over the front of the reamers to, uh, to get it to stabilize and to get rid of that reamer chatter. But by the time the chamber was cut, my total indicator reading was two ten thousandths of an inch on the chamber walls, and that's plenty, plenty good. So disaster averted because I was checking every about hundred thousandths of an inch of reamer plunge and made sure that I investigated the issue and resolved the issue before getting into that critical last part of, of the chamber cut. And again, what I did when I was checking headspace on the lathe was if you close on a go, you're going to uh, crush down everything when you tighten the receiver to the barrel. And then you're going to have an undersized chamber. So what I do is I cut it to two thousandths long by putting a piece of masking tape on or transparent tape, scotch tape, on the back of the go gauge. That gives you a go gauge plus two, so it's kind of like a two ten thousandths of an inch no-go gauge at that point. Cut the chamber to the appropriate depth where the handle will just barely close on that. Now, because I've got a custom action with a recoil lug, a separate recoil lug, that's going to give you about a thousandth and a half of crush, and that means that my chamber should be at about a half of a thousandth over what a go gauge would yield, which is a nice tight chamber. Should chamber factory ammunition, no problem, but it's no bigger than it needs to be. And that worked out uh, perfectly. So that was the work on the breech end. Then came the muzzle end. And this particular barrel blank is, is interesting because it comes unfinished. So this is what the muzzle end looked like. There's a short stainless section here and you've got your carbon wrap that comes down and then there's some resin piled up here on the end. And it measured about 26 inches overall, the blank, and I wanted 24 inches finished. So I cut off about two inches of the end. I parted it on the lathe. And then I turned back a section and threaded it 5 8 24, a little bit long. I then used the muzzle end cutoff from my 300 PRC build barrel blank that I had laying around, 416R stainless from, from Benchmark. And I made a threaded ring that's 5 8 24 threading on the inside and oversize on the outside. Loctited that in place on the barrel, forming a junction there between where the carbon wrap stops and where this stainless ring sits. And then the Loctite also with the resin kind of glues it in place. I then profiled the outside to match the diameter of the carbon wrap where it comes down to, to the muzzle end. Now I've got a nice stainless shoulder that I can screw up a brake or a can against. And I'm not planning to use a brake on this gun. This is a hunting gun. I now have my Silent Soko Omega 30. I'm gonna use a can if I'm hunting. And why wouldn't I, right? <laughs> so now we've got a finished muzzle. I cut it down to length. I cut the crown, a recessed crown like I, like I normally do. And it looks absolutely beautiful. And uh, that's just a part of the, the unique aspects of this particular build that, uh, that I enjoyed doing. Tightened the action onto the barrel and my headspace landed perfectly. 
it would close on the go gauge and it would not close on the go gauge plus two. And it would also not close on the Manson no-go gauge, which I've measured these. These are typically about five thousandths to eight thousandths longer than the go gauge. So now I have all the information to validate that I can feel safe about, build, about shooting this rifle that I just built. I also applied one of the things I learned from Gordy's class, and that's to do visual checks when you're done. This is just the make doubly sure that you didn't forget anything stupid kind of a thing. To check to make sure that the case is fully supported up to the point where the extraction groove starts. If you do your math wrong, you know, you've got a counterbore here that you've cut, that kind of thing, you can end up with too much unsupported chamber, and that's really where you're going to run into trouble. That's one of the main causes of people blowing up guns. <laughs> so overall, there was some really interesting things to, to learn, especially on the muzzle end. Uh, I also chucked it up in the lathe and did a polish on, on both ends, since I don't yet have a barrel spinner. It's a, a really nice way to do it. I made a threaded cap, chucked that up on the headstock side, and then run a, a live center on the tailstock side, spin it in place, I did a little polish on the shank here, and then uh, double checked and polished the ring here that I cut on the muzzle end. Then it was time to test fit everything together and to handle some stock inlet. Anytime you're doing a custom rifle build, you can expect to do some fitting. It's just inevitable. All of these custom parts can vary a little bit with dimensions, just enough where you have to do something special. So I'm gonna take the, barreled action out of the stock here to kind of show you some of the things I did. Uh, removing the action screws here, that was one thing. Uh, I found that I didn't have a rear action screw that was long enough. I'm using a custom bottom, bottom metal here from Red Stake Tactical. They had supplied a couple screws, but the rear one wasn't quite long enough. So I went to my screw supplier and I actually got a whole bunch of quarter 28 screws of various lengths. That way I can cut them down and use them for a variety of projects because those are the kind of things that will inevitably you know delay a project which is never what you want so i had this trigger tech special on on and off a few times to to test very th various things and what i noticed was when i installed my red snake tactical bottom metal there was a little bit of an interference between the front of the trigger housing, which is oversized with respect to a typical factory Remington 700 trigger, and the bottom metal here where the trigger guard is. So I clamped the bottom metal in the Precision Matthews PM949 TV and found the appropriate end mill and milled out a very slight pocket here. And that's just to provide clearance between the, the bottom metal where the trigger guard is and that front little hump on the Trigger Tech Special. On the stock, I also had to use a Dremel with a sanding wheel just to clean up where the painted on finish wrapped around the edge and to provide just a little a bit of clearance so that this bottom metal would slide in. It's, it's nice and tight now. I fit that carefully. The bottom metal also comes uh, with the, the mag catch the roll pin and the spring separate. So I put that together. Uh, the, the pin was just slightly large, so I, I used a little bit of a smaller pin so that it would slide in more easily because I'm thinking I might need to tune the length of this just a little bit because that's what catches the mag. And on a custom rifle build, the, the height of the mag where it sits is going to affect your feed. So with the bottom metal fit and with the clearance work done, I know I didn't have a problem with the trigger or the bottom metal. Then it was time to take a look at how the barrel sat in the channel. And I did notice straight away that because the shank is longer here than I guess what was accounted for, I had barrel clearance issues. So the first stage in inletting for the barrel was I took my custom spade bit that I've cut down to sort of a round profile and I ground, re-ground it to an even smaller diameter. Got the stock set up with some levels 
used a, an edge finder with, with a cone feature on it to locate off of one of the action screw holes here where the pillar is to get it centered. And then I cut this channel a little bit further forward. Nice slow feed. These spade bits with a custom grind on them work really, really well. I've used them with fiberglass and now with carbon fiber works, works really well. That got me clearance for the shank. And then where the transition is, I used a drill driver with a miniature drum sander on it and worked the profile of that a bit. And what I found is this carbon comes off really, really easy. So you have to be a little bit careful not to get uh, gouging. Did multiple fits, did the dollar bill trick to make sure that I had you know, sufficient clearance and you can feel it in the action screw as well. If there's any binding, if you feel a little bit of springing, it's likely that something is hitting and that you're compressing it. So I validated I didn't have any springing. Nice feel on the action screws. Did the clearance trick with the dollar bill. And that basically means that I'm ready now to bed the barreled action into the stock. And I'm gonna use Marine Tech's epoxy for that. And that I'm gonna let set up for a couple days and then onto the scope install. Now for this project, I've got a Leupold Mark V. This is the 5HD 7 to 35 by 56. What's special about this scope is that it's got 35 millimeter rings. And that means that I'm not gonna be able to lap using a regular lapping bar because I think I only have one inch and 30 millimeter. Another thing I picked up at Gordy's class was to do uh, epoxy bedding or glass bedding on the scope rings. So I might give that a try. Uh, but before that, I'll have an unboxing video on this Leupold Mark V. And really looking forward to getting this all put together because I haven't shot my own 6.5 PRC yet and we're getting incredibly close. <laughs> so make sure that you're subscribed with notifications. Don't forget I'm gonna have in the video description a link to the full article with more details, links to you know product pages, all that if you want to check that stuff out. Here's what I wanna know is what do you think? What do you think of what I've put together here and what I'm building? I would love to hear your feedback. Please drop a comment. Don't forget, I've got Ultimate Reloader shirts at the store. I'm on Patreon. Links in the video description. Until next time, happy shooting and happy reloading.